Today I'm gonna to make an apple stack cake. So right now I'm just starting my apples to cook in my dried apples. I'm using a pound of apples and that's about something like 14 cups of dried apples if you don't have a scale to, to go by. And these are just apples that I dried. So the first step is putting them all in the pot. And you think that's a lot of apples, it is, but the cake has a lot of layers and these will cook down once they're reconstituted. And you could use dry, fresh apples if you don't have dried apples. It's just that when you dry apples, just like anything that's dried, it kind of intensifies the flavor, it gives it a richness that, that you just don't get with things that are not dry. Drying them really does something for them. I guess it solidifies all those wonderful flavors and it just gives a richer taste. You can also, if you don't have enough dried apples uh, to use, you can use a mixture of fresh apples and, and dried apples. And you can also use like uh, apple butter. If you have apple butter, add you a jar of my apple butter to it to stretch the apples. And some people just prefer to use apple butter in place of the apples. But the, um, the way that I like to do it is to reconstitute my dried apples and cook them down with some sugar and other spices. So now I'm gonna add some water. So I've added, I don't know, probably about eight cups of water till it starts to come up inside the apples. They're not totally covered. And then I'm gonna uh, let them begin to cook. And as they cook, you can stir them and kind of mash them down. And then once they begin to get soft, you'll I'll show you, we'll add the other ingredients. But this is something that, it takes quite a while uh, and you don't wanna leave them, you know, just some, not something that you can totally leave. You just need to come back and check on it every few minutes or every little bit at least to make sure that the water doesn't all cook out and you know, then your apples would scorch. So my apples are getting really soft. They've probably been cooking, almost, I guess, almost two hours. And during that time, I've had to add quite a bit of water back to them. I mean, probably at least 10 cups of water, if not more. You just kind of have to keep an eye on them as they begin to soften. So I'm gonna add, I've got a cup of brown sugar. Whoops, and I had a big splash from throwing it in. Shouldn't have done that. I've got a half a cup of white sugar. I've got one teaspoon of cinnamon, a fourth of a teaspoon of cloves, and a half teaspoon of allspice that I'm going to add. So there's my spices. Make sure. And then I'm going to stir that in. The dessert that is most synonymous with Appalachia is apple stack cake. Now, when you hear the word apple stack cake, lots of things come to mind for different people. There's lots of variations of it. Some of the layers, some of the cakes uh, are small and they still call it apple stack cake, but maybe it only has two layers and it's really more like a cake. My granny Gazzy would make what she just called an applesauce cake, which was really just two layers of cake in regular cake pans, so thick layers, and then she put applesauce all over it, a sweetened applesauce. They were really good. Uh, and maybe she put applesauce in the cake batter too. I mean, as she made the cake, I'm not sure. I, I need to ask Granny about that one. But those were really good, and that was a common cake that was often on her table, her kitchen table. Uh, other people um, make layers that are very thin, like a cookie, and then they stack them up really high, and then they put apples, dried apples, that they've reconstituted between them with spices, lots of different spices, uh, and that's an apple stack cake. That's the kind that I make. That's the kind that I prefer. Uh, some people make, you know, really like set, uh, maybe 11 layers. Some people make maybe just four or five layers. And some, like I said, are make uh, thicker layers. And then some, the really thin ones, like I like to make, more like really you're making a giant cookie. But then when you put them all together in layers with the, the uh, putting apples in between them, it, it makes it into a cake. So there's lots of variations out there. And, in, and I encourage you, if you're interested in making one, to do research and figure out which one kind of maybe might be most like what you think your family would like. Even when it comes down to the apples, like I said, Granny Gazzy used applesauce. Some people use apple butter. Some people use a mixture of apple butter or applesauce and either fresh apples or dried apples. So even that varies greatly uh, between people. 
Now, when you read lots of the histories about apple stack cake, you can find all kinds of really heartwarming, fascinating stories. Well, one of the ones I heard uh, back years ago, um, and I didn't really grow up in a family that made the apple stack with the big layers, like I said. The one I was familiar with was more of what Granny Gazzy made, which was more like really a cake with uh, spiced applesauce all over it. Anyway, but one of the first stories when I heard about apple stack cakes was I heard, well, there's this really romantic, wonderful story that you'll hear told that um, in the old days, when a, someone would get married, this was the cake, you know, this was like the specialty cake that people would want at special times, but especially during a, a marriage, an upcoming marriage, and that different people in the community would bring a layer of cake and contribute, and then they would stack them and they would, you know, put the apples on them and all that. Really heartwarming story, right? Well, after that, I read, well, no, that's there's really just no basis that that's really true. That probably didn't happen. But, um, you know, because when you think about it, this is a cake that usually is, is, well, not usually, it needs to sit. It's better if it sits overnight, at least, if not longer. And so you think, well, no, they couldn't really bring the layers. That wouldn't have worked out time-wise. But I always think, well, I mean, you know, maybe. Maybe they come the day before and said, uh, you know, maybe it was... Uh, Matt coming the day before saying here's the cake layer tipper made for the wedding and we'll see you tomorrow when it when it gets here you know maybe they sent it ahead of time maybe in those days a lot of times uh, any kind of celebration like that would be an all-day affair so maybe they come early in the morning and the women all brought their layers and they you know stacked it up and then they let it set till late that afternoon i don't know that's just me wanting to believe that beautiful romantic story of of everyone pitching in to help for the upcoming wedding so the recipe that i do like to use the one that i make comes from one of my favorite appalachian cookbooks it's sydney sailor Farr's more than moonshine it's just a great book and it's got great recipes in it but i also love it that she's put all these little tidbits about appalachia about her growing up in appalachia she grew up in kentucky uh, near Berea uh, in that area and it, she's just got wonderful information. Now her husband was from Western North Carolina so some of the recipe, recipes is from his family so I, I, I really like that because I'm like well she had a piece of you know where I'm the part of Appalachia where I'm from from the Fars from the uh, where her husband was actually born and raised. Anyway but it's a great recipe so this is what she has to say about it. Well, first I'll go over the ingredients and I'll put all this information, there'll be a link in the description below where you can just go straight to uh, the blind pig and the acorn and find the, wet, the entire recipe there. But it's a half a cup of shortening, a half a cup of sugar, one egg well beaten, one third cup molasses, which is sorghum, what I would say is sorghum, I'm using sorghum syrup today, a half a cup of buttermilk, three and a half cups of flour, that's plain flour, a half a teaspoon of soda, bacon soda, as Granny would say, a half a teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of ginger, one teaspoon of vanilla, and then cooked dried apples. So I'm going to read you her um, instructions and then I'll kind of show you how to do it. So she says, preheat your oven to 350 degrees, cream your shortening and sugar, add beaten egg, molasses, buttermilk, and mix well. Sift flour, soda, salt, and ginger into a bowl. Make hole in center of dry ingredients and put in creamed mixture. Stir in until well blended. Add vanilla, stir well. And roll out dough as you would for pastry. Cut to fit nine inch pan or heavy skillet. This amount of dough will make seven layers. Bake layers for 10 to 12 minutes or until lightly browned. When cool, stack layers with spiced, sweetened, old fashioned dried apples. Spread between the layers and smooth around sides. Sprinkle top with powdered sugar. Prepare cake at least a day before you serve it and slice very thin. And then she says to cook dried apples, put one pound apples in heavy pan and cover with water. Cook until soft enough to mash. You may need to add water several times to keep apples from sticking to pan. While still hot, mash the apples and add one cup brown sugar, one half cup white sugar, one teaspoon cinnamon, one fourth teaspoon cloves, and one half teaspoon allspice. If you do not have dried apples, pare and quarter several pounds of cooking apples. Put apples in water in heavy pan and cook until just done. 
add one cup brown sugar, a half a teaspoon cinnamon, one fourth teaspoon allspice, and dash of cloves and cook until mixture is very thick. So those, that was her instruction. So now I'm gonna show you how I kind of do it. <laughs> I do follow her uh, recipe, but kind of how I put it all together. So Sydney Sailor Farr says to just do it in a bowl. I just go ahead and get my mixer out just to make it faster. So I'm gonna put in the shortening, whoops, and the sugar and cream that together. such a little amount that you may need to scrape down your bowl to make sure it all gets mixed in. So now I'm going to add the buttermilk, the sorghum, and the egg. Hard not to want to lick that. I love sorghum. Scrape down the bowl. And let it mix just a little bit more. So now we're going to sift our dry ingredients. Here's our flour. And here's the sodi, salt, and ginger. And then we're going to start adding it to our mixture. Just a little cup there. got that mixed in we're going to add our vanilla okay the next step is we're going to get the dough out I'm going to you'll need a little bit of additional flour just to put on my board there and you can see now this is not really like a cake batter it's more like a cookie batter Once you've got it out, you need to think about how we're going to divide it. So what I like to do is kind of make it into a um, kind of a, I guess you would say a long roll. So then what, that way I can kind of divide it into narrow, into the pieces. Now Sydney Sailor Farr said it usually makes seven pieces, so that's what you could aim for. But <laughs> sometimes I end up with more layers than that. Maybe it's because I do mine thinner than she would have. Um, but for either way, it works. Once the cake is really done and ready to eat, you'll never notice whether how many layers it actually has in it. Corey's trying to help me out here, so I won't be sliding around. Thank you, Corey. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to be really technical, you can look and see. Oh man, that was like seven inches, so I could do it on it each inch, right? Am I on the right thing? I think. Well, almost. I might have got, I'll save that one to the end. So then you're going to get your little layers. To the side. And you probably have a more scientific way of doing this than me. And that's just fine. But I'm telling you, either way it works out. So since the dough is so soft, you may need to add... You definitely need to put down some flour and then you may need to add some to it too to make it um, stiff enough to actually be able to roll out without it tearing on you. And you kind of put it, make it in a circle, a general circle. And 
and start rolling it. Kind of getting the same. You just want them to be generally the same size. The tape's already coming up. But you can also kind of roll it out, trying to keep your circle there. Kind of go a little bit over your edges. And then take your cake pan, set it on top of it, and just kind of trim around the edges. Well, I got that one close. I could have probably just used it. transfer it to your pan and since it is so such a soft dough let's see Corey come and assist me bring that over here this bring it closer you'll need to kind of gently put it on and you can take uh, a brush and brush some of the flour off but it's really not going to hurt it so now that you get it on your baking sheet like this then we're going to bake it in a 350 degree oven for about 10 to 12 minutes. You just want to keep a check on, especially the first few that you do, so that you can tell how long it takes in your oven. But you want it to be done. I mean, you want it to be firm. It'll kind of get light brown around the edges. Just think of like if you were making a giant cookie. It's kind of the exact same thing. So I'm gonna put this one, to, and uh, hopefully if you've got baking sheets, sometimes my bigger baking sheets, I can put two on at a time, which helps. But I'm going to get Corey to come help me do the rest of the layers, and then we'll show you how to put the cake together. So Corey and I ended up with eight layers, eight layers, um, and we had this little bit left over. So you could definitely make them a little thinner, I mean a little thicker we could have and had like uh, Sydney Sailor Far had less used, I think she said seven. Once I start rolling them out, I always end up with more. If you do have some left over, like what me and Corey did, we're just going to bake this little one, what were you calling it Corey, the baby? The baby. The baby, and me and Corey will have a good snack, good dessert for our supper, I mean for our dinner that we're about to eat. So you might ask, well what if, uh, even though ours are generally all the same size, Corey was asking me, one of hers got tore and then we kind of just put it back together. Well what does that, is that going to make the cake look bad? It's not going to make the cake look bad at all because once you, once you put the apples all over the cake, and then you let it sit and all that goodness just soaks into this part, you really can't tell the shape. I mean, this will just completely kind of disappear into cake and apples and mm, it'll be so good. But you won't really notice like these little edges where I didn't cut very uh, well or where uh, Corey had to repair hers, one of her layers. Uh, it'll all be okay because the apple goodness will just make it all look like it's a perfectionist even though it's not really. And I'm sure you can do a better job at it too as well. But even if you're like us and you have some jagged edges, it still turns out very well. So now we're ready to put the cake together. We've got all of our layers made, they've all baked, and now we're gonna start stacking them and putting in between uh, each layer, we're going to put some of our wonderful apples that we cooked. So I thought I, earlier I seen a really thick one I wanted to put on the bottom. Maybe that was it? I don't know. I'm going to put it. I'm going to put us a big spoonful. And then kind of smooth it to the edges. 
Now, Sydney Sailor Farr, she suggests that you should out coat the outside of the cake with apples too. I don't ever do that. That's kind of like my Granny Gazzy's applesauce cake. She did do that. She would um, make sure that the outside was covered too. And you can certainly do that. And truthfully, why I don't do it is because I'm, I'm lazy and I don't want to take the extra effort. <laughs> So I just like to leave it up near the edges like that so that it'll kind of peek out the edges, but not, I'm not actually going to try to ice or coat the sides. And if you have a, uh, any layer, I had one like this one's kind of got a crack in it. It doesn't matter. Just put it right there. It'll be fine. All this goodness will just soak right into it and you'll never know that it was cracked. Oh, it smells so good. I wish you could smell this. So, and this is a good cake to make for a, a holiday or a celebration like the wedding we were talking about because you can um, make it ahead of time because the as it sits, it marries, as Matt would say. So all those flavors will really seep into that, like that kind of crunchy, hard cookie base and marry together. Mm, it'll be so good. I always try to save my prettiest one for the top. That one right there might be the prettiest. I'm not sure. I don't know. That one's kind of pretty too. Well, that's a good sign if I can't really decide which one's pretty. As I was talking about the different, that's funny, there's an apple seed. I don't know how that ended up in my dried apples. As I was talking about the different recipes, it, uh, part of that is also different spices. I've seen some apple stack cakes that add like a hint of citrus or something like that, and I'm sure those are really good too. Uh, some add more ginger or more uh, cinnamon, you know, the different amounts in, in other words, but I really like this recipe. And maybe it's because I just, I never met Sydney Sailor Far, but boy, I wish I could have met her. Her writings so speak to me. Okay. Let's see. Oh no, I'm having a hard time deciding what I think is the prettiest one for the top. So she did, in, she does encapsulate hers, so she puts these on top. Or oh, no, let's see, she said add um, powdered sugar, so maybe she didn't mean to put them on top, but I generally do not put the top layer. I don't put any on the very top, and I usually do sprinkle it with powdered sugar. You can use like a, and I'll show you that t tomorrow when this has had time to sit, but you can use like a leaf uh, and kind of sprinkle, leave a little pattern. That makes an especially pretty cake. Okay, and we'll have to call in reinforcements. Corey, which one of these do you think is the prettiest for the top? Mm. This one, maybe? That one or this one? So I can go ahead with this one. Yeah. Pretty, I think we ended up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, I said eight. That was right. Eight layers. So you can see as you think about the layers um, and how they, how they look, you can see why that story about each family bringing a layer, why that uh, seems so so plausible but so lovely too. But as I said, I've read that really wasn't how it went. But maybe you know it did. Maybe your family did share layers. I think that's a wonderful custom. And in those days, when you think about how hard food was to come by, it makes sense. I've already forgot which one Corey told me to say. I think it was that other one. And if you feel like your label, if you get kind of wonky, don't worry about it. It's still going to taste fantastic. That's what I always worry about is more the taste than how it looks. I bet that one needs a top. I don't know, though. That one looks bigger, so maybe you should do that. I think I like that one. Okay. I don't know. 
um, you, I'll do you like I, your daddy says I do him, but I ask for his opinion just so I can do the just opposite. So you can get the opposite. And that he he learned that about me really quickly. So then sometimes he says he just messes with me and tells me the opposite because he knows then I'll choose really what he wants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So if you have any apples left over, you could have, you can try to do like what Sydney Sailor Farr said she, you know, would smear it on the outside. Um, but also you can uh, just eat it. Maybe uh, make a pan of biscuits. Mm, that'd be really good. Make up a few fried pies with it. That would be really, really good. Me and Corey have this extra little one that we, extra little cookie. I think I'll put it on it, and we won't wait till tomorrow to eat that one. You could let your apples cool. You can probably see mine's kind of still hot. That's okay. I'm usually too impatient. But if you do those, you could even do those ahead of time and then do the put the cake together all on the same day. I think this might be the prettiest one I've ever made because Corey helps me. Oh, you sweet. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Okay. There it is. Pretty. So we're going to let it sit till tomorrow and you'll be surprised by how it kind of sinks because all that goodness, all that juicy apple goodness is going to kind of meld it all together. So it won't be quite this tall by tomorrow. And I'll just cover this and set it, um, I won't put it in the refrigerator, I'll just set it in kind of off to the side in the kitchen uh, away from the stove and then we'll, we'll show you what to do next after it's sit all night. So the cake's been soaking up all that goodness for 24 hours. So today we're ready to taste it. I'm gonna set this over and to decorate it. You can see kind of the uh, layers have kind of sunk down a little bit. And if you feel they're soft, it's no longer that hard crunchy uh, cookie like it was when we first put it together. Now to decorate it, a lot of people put apples on top. So if you do that, you're already done with it. You could use, you could certainly leave it like it is. I think it's a very pretty rustic cake. I like to put powdered sugar on it. You can use like a, uh, you could just put powdered sugar. That'd be really easy. You can use a stencil like a cookie cutter or a leaf or something to get a relief and do that. And that's what I'm gonna do today. So I've got me a, a little leaf here. I'm gonna put right in the middle on top. And then I'm just gonna take my powdered sugar and shake all around the edges. You wouldn't want to do this part until right before you're about to serve it because what happens is because it is such a moist cake it will just soak up that powdered sugar so if you like did this and come back in a few hours the powdered sugar would just be gone and you wouldn't be able to see it so you'd want to wait till right before you were about to to serve it to do this last step if you decide to do this and you can just put a little or you can put a lot okay now, you've got to just remove whatever you use very gently. Ah, and that leaves the perfect little indention of the cake, of the leaf, sorry, on the cake. So now that we've got it all beautiful, all prettified, as we would say, uh, you got to think about how you want to eat it. You could just serve it, it would be so good, just like this. You could use whipped cream, um, certainly if you wanted to do that. I like to use custard, what we call float here in Appalachia, and I have a video about float, so I'll link to that so you can go see how to make it. Very, very simple. It's just a custard is what it is. A lot of people might make it to go with pound cake and things like that, but it goes really good with this. So I've already made some of that and let it chill this morning. So now I'm going to cut me a piece of this beautiful, beautiful cake um, and see what it tastes like. It's unusual for me to get to taste the the first bite, the first piece. So I can't wait. Most people, I mean, you know, depending on your appetite, if you want a big piece or a little piece, but generally these cakes kind of you do, you can come back for seconds, but try to do it with a smaller um, cake, piece of cake, just so you can see those beautiful layers. Oh, it's so pretty. So you can see the beautiful layers, all those little layers, and let's see, let me get my fork. 
you can see it's really soft now. Those layers are no longer crunchy like they were when we first put it together. So now I'm going to put me some custard on it. Maybe I'll scoop that right out of the way. You could drizzle it all over it. I like to put it just at the edge there. And then I'm going to get to take a bite. Mm. So good. You can see for sure why this cake is like the most kind of the representation of Appalachian food waste. It is so good. And then it uses the apples really plays into the thing that apples is, is such a popular fruit in Appalachia that it's often just called fruit. So you can certainly see that. Mm. This is not a cake that's overly sweet. You probably noticed from the recipe. Now the apples have a lot of sugar in them, but the cake act part actually didn't. So it's not overly sweet. So that custard really, really goes well with it. So good. A cake that's very kind of more labor intensive to make, but so worth it. Even if you only make it, which is usually the only time I make it, is around the holidays or for something really special. a very special occasion, but it's always worth it, even though it takes a little bit more effort. It takes more effort to make it, but in one way, being able to make it ahead of time, it certainly frees you up for the day of Thanksgiving or uh, Christmas or whatever kind of celebration that you're having. So that's the plus side of it. You might have to do more work up front, but then it's all done. So I hope you enjoyed seeing how I make apple stack cake. Like I said, there's so many variations out there. I encourage you to research before you decide which one you want to try. But if you try this one, I know you'll really love it. And I hope, as always, you continue to drop back by and help me celebrate Appalachia, which is a whole lot of Appalachian foodways.